My hearing aid battery died while I was filming this video. But look, now you get a behind the scenes look of how you change a hearing aid battery. Although statistically, my audience is like 55 and older, so you probably already know how to change a hearing aid battery. And look for a job in the town. Hey folks, this week we're doing another famous Tony Rice break, but this one is really just half of a break because he splits it with Jerry Douglas. You may know Jerry Douglas as the Green Goblin from the Spider-Man franchise. Just kidding. Jokes, we can make them in the bluegrass community, calm down. Anyway, just nine measures of Tony Rice this time. Nine grains of rice, if you will. Tony Rice joined J.D. Crowe's band in 1971, replacing current lead vocalist and guitarist Doyle Lawson. Tony had left the Bluegrass Alliance to join. One tin soldier rides away. And later that same year, the Alliance would disband to form New Grass Revival. At the time, Tony's brother Larry was playing mandolin. Larry Rice left J.D. Crow in 1974 and was replaced with Ricky Skaggs. In 1975, this lineup would record the highly influential J.D. Crow and the New South album that Old Home Place appears on. Tony Rice brought in Old Home Place from the Dillards, who you may know as the Darlins from their appearances on The Andy Griffith Show. One other famous musician who appears on The Andy Griffith Show and a hugely influential guitarist on Tony's playing was Clarence White. Tony tracked down and became the owner of Clarence White's D28 the same year this album was cut. With a brilliant lineup and a legendary guitar, the recording session didn't go as smoothly as you might believe, though. I cut my right thumb right before we went in to do the album. I remember doing this album, trying to hold a flat pick, but I had stitches in my hand exactly where the pick goes. After a few tracks like that, I got annoyed by it. So I called John Starling, who was a surgeon, and said, hey, come down here and take these stitches out. John Starling, founding member of the Seldom Scene, who had served as a surgeon in Vietnam, came to the studio and cut out Tony's stitches. That is one hell of a story to go with a famous recording, but enough of that. Let's talk about what Tony's doing in this break. So there's a lot that Tony Rice fits into this little break, but assuming that you already know a little bit about flat picking, there's probably five big things to talk about. And those things are pentatonic scales, double stops, blue notes, sixths, and floating. These are all things that have been covered in previous videos, so I'm gonna do my best to give quick examples. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna show you are some major pentatonic shapes for G and C, because those are the chords that he plays pentatonic stuff over. Um, let's take a look at it. You probably know this shape, let's blast through it. For C, we have this one. Cool, those should be familiar to you. All right, let's move on, double stop. So if you take a chord shape and play any two notes from that chord shape, that's a really easy way to get a double stop. For instance, right here, right here, or right here. In this case, Tony favors this one. This is a really great way to start acknowledging what chord you're playing over when you're playing single note lines. Whether you do that by playing this at the same time, or alternating the notes, or maybe sliding into them. All right, so the next thing we should probably take a look at are blue notes. And I recently did a blog post on blue notes. You can check that out at my website, listenswithmarcel.com. But I'm gonna do a really quick explanation right here. There's two big ones that we wanna think about, and they're basically the dominant seventh that you can get from a G7 chord like that, and the minor third, which you can get by moving the third down a half step. So that means we have three Fs we can use. We have two B flats that we can use. And our full pentatonic scale becomes something like this. Remembering that these aren't notes that we have to include in the scale, they're notes that we might include, right? Spices, not requirements. All right, so after that, we should probably talk about sixths. Basically, it's a third. So for instance, in the key of D, how about, or over a D chord, um, we could have the root and then the third. Now, if I take the root and I put it an octave up, these two notes are now a sixth apart. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's like a spread out third. And you can use these to imply chords really well. So for instance, if you move upwards, you get this. 
This is really classic sort of country language. And when I pass this one, I very briefly imply an A7. But when I finish, once again, I'm implying a D chord. So this would be kind of like a D, A7, D movement. Um, the movement that we care about more today, though, is implying a D7 using this, which you could do like this. Moving the same shape backwards. And what I end up right here on the end is this is the ninth and this is the seventh of the D7 chord. So I'd end up with almost like a D9 chord. Really common country language, though. That kind of thing should be familiar to you. All right, and the very last thing I want to make sure that you have in your head is the idea of floating. So if I take a major scale like this, um, I can float this. What I mean by floating is I can play the, all of the fretted notes up to the neck, but I can keep all the open strings where they are. That might sound crazy, but it sounds like this. Believe it or not, Tony floats in this break. I know, a lot of people miss it when they make tabs, but it's the truth. So here's the performance again. Try to see if you can spot the changes in how Tony's thinking. And look for a job in town. Wonderful, I'm glad you've gotten this far. Let's do a, a full breakdown and let's see if we can talk about the techniques he's using in each part, as well as some practice tips mixed in. All right, cool, looking at the actual break. I like this part. Now, the actual kickoff is once again a little squirrely, just like the last one. It comes in on a lot of off beats, right? It's syncopated. So it doesn't start on beat one, it starts on the and of one. And a really nice way to feel that is by playing a dead downstroke for beat one. So one and, right? That's not cheating or anything, it's just an easy way to feel it. If I had to go through this, just, I hate going through things slowly like this, but this is an example. Here's one and, now there would be another downstroke here, so you can ghost that away from the strings. The open G string comes in on the and, and then this phrase happens just like you would expect it to be. Moving forward, we have actual measure one of Tony's break. We have that double stop that Tony's sliding into, just like we talked about what happened. He's implying part of a G chord using these two notes. After that, we get this phrase, which is, oh man, it's terrifyingly brutal. And you might be saying, hey Marcel, how do you know it's not just something like... Well, that is a good question. And it's because I saw in this performance, you can actually see his pinky go up, and those are the notes that he's playing. Moving on over the C chord, we have the standard Tony language we've seen before. After that, as we go forward, we have this. Oh, and that is funky. Why would Tony do that? Why didn't he just include the G there? I think you'd have to ask Tony, but if I had to hazard a guess, this uh, implies like a, a diminished scale to play over a dominant chord. It's not a dominant chord right here, but he's still using it the same way. <laughs> but in bluegrass, like this. Uh, all right, cool. So once again, he's doing some floating. We're including open strings while we're up the neck, right? This could have been. But... Right, lots of inclusions of open strings up here. Right, a very cool line. He's working out of a D7 arpeggio right here as he does that. Don't think too much about bending that string. If you can just get a little curl in there, you're fine, and that's more than enough. Um, to end it out, last measure right here we have. And that is one of them sixth, right? He's got a D, he's turning it into a D7, and Tony's out. That's the, uh, that's the whole break. All right, so you should be well on your way to figuring this stuff out. So I'm gonna perform the break at 90 BPMs, then at 120 BPMs. Now the actual recording is at 125 BPM. So if you can play it along with me at 120, you're probably ready to hit it along with the real recording.
All right, here we are again. If you like taking a lesson from the biggest, baddest Billy Goat in the barnyard, remember that you can go to LessonsWithMarcel.com and you can support this channel and help me make more of these videos by purchasing some merch, some tabs, some transcriptions, or some Skype lessons. Remember, I can't keep making these videos without your support. But if free stuff is more your style, you should definitely check out the blogs that we have at LessonsWithMarcel.com and you should check out Jazz and Grass on Instagram where we do a new jazz or bluegrass lick six days a week. Anyway, I, I guess I'll see you next time.